Hello, hello, and welcome back to our Chemical Serenity Pagan podcast. Let's take a walk through the woods, across the fields and moors, down to the beach, where we can sit by the campfire and talk about all things pagan, druidry and witchy, in a way that works with you, your path and on this experience of being human. My name is Carolyn and I have been on my spiritual path for the last 45 years, having been launched into it by spirit in my early teens. Now, if you're new to my podcast or channel, then welcome. Find your earpods, a favourite brew and a comfy chair and then just sit back and listen in. Everyone is welcome here. We are all inclusive and because after all the paths that we walk are all different and the choices we make are for different reasons and for different experiences. And I love to hear from you in the comments about your experiences and maybe why you think you're here. If you're a regular listener, thank you once again for stopping by. It's lovely to have you here. And let's get into today's podcast. If you've listened to my podcast on the Wheel of the Year in February 2024, then you will understand where the origins of calling the festival Ostara came from on the wheel itself. Now, if you are new to my podcast and you've just, um, just found me, then I'll just quickly say that the name was given to this point on the wheel by an American called Aidan Kelly in 1974 when he was asked to create a diagram of the Wheel of the Year for a magazine called The Egg in the US to explain the neo-pagan eight-fold wheel and the season of Wiccan and Druidry. Um, and these were the ones that were put together by Gerald Gardner and Ross Nichols. Now, there is a bit more to it than that, but for the purpose of this podcast, um, that is the succinct version. Ostara was a name on a point, on a wheel, given by somebody else. And it's obviously very, very new. It is neo-pagan. Ostara was that name given by Edin Kelly, and he had to come up with something for that, and it's a Wiccan festival. Ostara is also um, a very little-known goddess. In fact, the only information we have on her is based on the mythology of West Germany. Then are there are different pronunciations of Ostara, so... Um, I've heard is Ostara, and there are other ones which is the soft version, which is Ostara. You know, it doesn't really matter how you pronounce it, as as the origins of Ostara is Istra anyway, um, who is the German spring goddess. Um, you can look her up online if you want to. I'm going to leave that with you, however, because, uh, the, again, there's not a great deal to look for. It It's it's one of those difficult things, really. You know, when you, you're looking for... Um, a reason for a goddess there isn't much one um, for this one so but just to confuse the issue even more Ostara was the goddess of April <laughs> taken from the world Ostramoneth in Anglo-Saxon and in High German it was Ostermonath so that <laughs> that really helps doesn't it now, I've read that the um, Venerable Bede wrote in the 8th century about a goddess of March called Reda. Now, this was taken from the word Repmonath, but Bede is the only person to have mentioned her. And it's one of those things where nobody knows if there's any truth in that one at all. So, however we pronounce it, Ostar is a Wiccan festival. And I can say that because I have been in... Um, both Coven and walk, walk the solitary path with Wicca in, in my past. Um, so I'm going to park Ostara for a while because um, I'm also fully aware that many of you that listen in here are not particularly interested in, in goddesses um, or you may have a goddess that you already work with. But what we're going to do now is talk just about the season of the equinox itself. Although I haven't covered Druji, um, I will one day. It's a biggie to unpack and it will take me some time to explain it fully. Um, but for now, let's just work with the fact that we know about the stone circles. We are know about offerings to the gods. We know about how druids were star watchers. They had seers to look into the future. They had astronomers watching the planets and the stars in the sky. And they would track all of this and they understood the seasons were changing. So all the signs we see today, they saw. Although I think probably in the UK there was a lot more snow, whereas now we just get rain. So those of us who follow a more druid-based path are connected to the seasons of change 
like this one of, as it was called by the Druids, Albin Elia, meaning light of the earth. Um, also known as the spring or vernal equinox. Uh, if you are now in the southern hemisphere, you are going into Alban Elford and the autumn equinox. Now in Ireland, the spring equinox is also known as Mayan Ari, which um, just means spring. Now, as it was then, it is now. It's a time of balance. Uh, we've got equal daylight to nighttime hours because of the position of the sun in the sky. And it happens again, obviously, in September. Now, whatever you call it, it is the first cross-quarter date and it means the end of a season and the beginning of another. So this being the end of winter and the start of spring. The wheel may appear to be neo-pagan, but we do know that our ancestors would have followed a path aligned to the stars and those planets uh, in the sky and they were attuned to the cycles of nature, fertility, rebirth and death. So because we don't have anything to talk about as far as a goddess is concerned, we look at the main associations with the time of the year instead and two of those are hairs and eggs. Now we have only three types of hair in the UK. We have the brown hair which was originally thought to have been imported by the Romans but bones of hairs have been found that suggest the hair came along during the Iron Age, which was 1200 BC to 600 BC. Hairs have their babies four to two days after conception, and the babies are born fully coated with their eyes open. Now, something that you may find interesting, or even strange, because I did, is that the European brown hair can conceive a second litter just before it's about to give birth to the litter she's already carrying. Um, Aristotle made this claim 2,000 years ago and German scientists have just confirmed that he got it right. I'm not going to go into the sciencey bit and all that, to be perfectly honest. Um, if you wish to go and look that one up, you can do. That's what the internet's for. But it doesn't happen in rabbits, which is probably a good thing considering how we know how well they can breed. Now, if you live in the UK, anywhere near the Marlborough Downs in Wiltshire or the counties of Suffolk, Norfolk um, and Cambridgeshire, they are all particularly flat. This is where you will see many, many more hares. In the mountains of Scotland, we have our beautiful native mountain hare, which can also be found on the islands um, just off the mainland, the Shetland, Mold Sky. Plus, it's also been introduced into an area of the UK called the Peak District. Now, this hare is much smaller in size and in summer is a grey-brown colour, but in winter, their coats turn white, which allows them to be camouflaged when we, <laughs> we once used to have a lot more snow. Then we have the Irish hare, found only in Ireland and Northern Ireland on undisturbed grassland. Now, Irish hares were once widespread and common, but have been declining since the 1970s due to the changes in farming practices. Irish hares are similar to the mountain hare, but they're smaller and they don't develop the white coat in winter. However, just off the coast of Northern Ireland, there is a small island called Rathlin, and on there is an isolated population of golden hares who have a striking pale blonde fur and bright blue eyes. Early spring, at dusk or dawn, is the best time to see hares, as this is the, I suppose, breeding season now, but also they are nocturnal. Now, hares don't burrow and they don't live in communities like rabbits. They like to nest above the ground in long grassy areas. They live in what's called forms, which are shallow indentations in the ground. Now, the lapwing also does the same and has a shallow nest in grassy farmland and sometimes will steal the form of a hare to lay its eggs. So during the Anglo-Saxon month of Estramonas, freshly laid lapwing eggs could be found in hare's forms um, and because it was common then to eat wild eggs, as they were far more abundant um, than they obviously are today, maybe this is the possible origin of the Easter egg hunt. So if you went out looking for wild eggs and you found them in a hare's nest, um, you know, it's one of those things you can think of. Perhaps that's how the Easter, the Easter egg hunt started, um, was going out and hunting for eggs and finding them not necessarily in a nest but in a form of a hare you know something to think about now should you be out walking and you see some babies um, obviously called leverets then and they look like they have been abandoned it is highly unlikely that they have 
um, just walk on by and leave mum and dad to do their job. The, the mums and dads will be about somewhere. And this often happens. People go out on a walk and they see them. And go, oh, they've been abandoned. Something's frightened off mum and dad. Well, maybe so. But the babies are fine. Just leave them alone. Mum and dad will come back. Um, they have to go off and find food for themselves. Um, if you see boxing hairs, now uh, this isn't two males on the way home from a good night at the pub. It's a female giving a male a bit of a slap um, because she's not interested in his overzealous <laughs> advances. And this can go on for weeks. If you're in England and you see a brown thing run across the road in front of you at anything up to 45 miles per hour and you manage to see its long ears as it whizzes past you, if it's got a black ear tip, it's a hare. Anything else is just a super fast bunny rabbit. And if it uh, is white and it's holding a watch, then I would suggest you find a safe place to pull over and take a rest as clearly the excitement of the season has caught up with you. Please be aware that in the mating season, things get a bit crazy for hares and rabbits. Look out for them and look after them. They are in decline due to these changes in farming practices and we really don't want to lose them from our countryside. At one time in my past, I remember we could look in a field and you could see rabbits everywhere in abundance, but not anymore. Across Europe, painted eggs are given away at this time of the year to bring prosperity abundance and blessings and snakes will come out of their winter hibernation at spring. They shed their skin and they lay eggs. Again a sign of birth and renewal. And on warmer days as the season extends into April and May if it's dry and it's lovely and warm you may find them basking in the sun especially adders. Another association at this time of the year are hot cross buns. They're all in the shops at the moment but they have nothing to do with Christianity as they are actually Anglo-Saxon, which is pre-Christianity in Britain. And the cross is said to represent the four faces of the moon, or the elements of air, water, earth and fire. Now, good Queen Bess, or Elizabeth I, who ranged between 1558 and 1603, introduced a law stating that buns could only be baked for special occasions such as burials, Christmas and Good Friday. If you're an empath and sensitive to the earth energies, you may already be feeling the stirrings of spring, as not only the goddess is walking the land, but the green man is here, and he also symbolises the cycle of life, death and rebirth. The spring equinox is a fleeting moment of balance or equality as a solar ceremony, and if it feels, you know, it feels to me that we are stepping from one energy or realm into another. It's a whole shift in season into spring and we've made it through the winter and here we are ready to take on the coming seasons and to grow into our full potential. The energies at this time are symbolised by the waning or ending energies of winter and the waxing or beginning energies of summer. Learning that balance isn't static is very important because well, if it was static, we'd never move forward and eventually we'd be just frustrated on the path that we're walking. There is a rising power of energy and we all start to feel it. The goddess of the land is rising towards her potential too. There is a gentle hum of activity as the earth is awakening. Not just the bees buzzing as they pass you by or they go crazy in the blossoms on the trees, but the earth is starting to vibrate. You may also notice how windy it is in March and this is because the sun is warming up the land in day but the weather is still a little bit chilly and when warm air hits cold air it precipitates and we get wind. There is an old folk tale that farmers used to say and they still do today. If March comes in like a lion it goes out like a lamb which obviously means if the beginning of the month is harsh the end will be much more pleasant as we move into the potential of more spring energy. So what can we do for spring? Well, I suppose the biggest thing um, to do is a spring clean. Um, have a really good clear out, start a fresh new season. I always remember as a child, my mother moving the furniture in the lounge. The window was one of those cold spots and despite having long, thick curtains. So in the winter, she'd put the chairs there that no one really sat on. <laughs> The, the chairs we all liked to were away from the window. 
Um, I know some people who even change their curtains in spring to a lighter shade to reflect the coming months and then in autumn they change them back to the thicker curtains to keep out the winter cold. Although now I suppose we are very much hermetically sealed, aren't we, in our triple glazing and we don't even need curtains. This is the ideal time again though to dig out your favourite incense, herbs or essential oils to clear stagnant energy. Um, I like to use some homegrown sage um, when it's in abundance or I have a supplier who grows their own and I make my own ones to burn. Sage is a wonderful cleanser of stagnant energy. So I open up all the windows and doors and I walk the house getting into all the corners and clearing out all the old winter energy. Once done, I then do the same again with some Palo Santo, which attracts positive energies back into the house. All of which, I will say, is sustainably sourced, of course. Now, we may wish to use um, crystals to move your energy. A quartz crystal you can use as a wand will easily clear the room as well. Whilst having my spit clean, I also have a clear out of anything that isn't serving me well. It either goes to the local charity shop or the recycling centre. If you've read um, Dana O'Driscoll's book, Sacred Actions, she talks about consumerism and waste and materialism and decluttering. I'll leave a link in the show notes below if you want to take a look uh, into her book or even her just go uh, along to her website. So. Now that you're completely worn out from all that cleaning and all that decluttering and all that cleansing, it's time to cleanse you. Your energy will have waned over winter and despite a bit of a pep up at Imolk, what can we do to help you now? Another thing you might like to do is change your sacred space or altar. Place things that mean something to you and the change in season. You may like to add eggs, nests, birds and rabbits or maybe you like a simple circle with just a few crystals. You can also add your favourite flowers like crocuses and daffodils. Or what about balancing the elements? You could use a light and dark or dark stone or even a gemstone for earth, a feather for air, a small candle to light for fire and a bowl of rain or spring water for water in the west. Place these obviously at the appropriate element position on your sacred space, either indoors or outdoors. If you haven't got any of them I've mentioned, then there is no need to worry or even rush out and buy them. Just bring your intention and imagination. Many of my rituals are done with just my imagination. Um, I have used sticks. I have used stones, plants or absolutely nothing at all on my sacred space. When we use the same things all the time, their energy becomes stagnant. But when we find something new to replace an older item, it brings in a new energy. Crystals and stones for your sacred space can be clear quartz for clarity of thought or ideas, rose quartz to attract love of any kind into your energy field and aventurine for abundance. Take your time to meditate within your sacred space and connect with the energies. As the equinox comes closer, the energies will be greater. If you do any spell or intention work, then now is the time to set those intentions for the next few weeks as we move towards Beltana. If you like a bath, try a sacred bath cleanse with your favourite oils or bubble bath. If you prefer a shower, no doubt you'll have the fav- your favourite oils to use for that as well. With all the cleaning that you've been doing, you might well have now ruined your besom or besom. Uh, you are probably going to need a new one. Now, symbolically, for those following a witchy path, the besom was always used for clearing out the negative energies and occasional flights at Samhain. Now, if you are a crafty person, you may like to make your own. You can use birch twigs, uh, willow or hazel for the handle. Now, I do have one of my own. Um, I obviously only now use it for flying. But I don't make it. I buy one and symbolically my basin is used for protection and it stands in the house keeping watch. You could also get creative and maybe paint some eggs, create Equinox cards to send to friends or just paint for yourself freehand. Anything that comes to mind or even draw. Let your mind wander and see what happens. Sometimes when we just let go of our own thoughts and channel some energy, we access the deepest and most creative parts of ourselves. 
make some seed bombs or seed balls. These There are lots of recipes online for this, but they are great fun for the children or grandchildren to do. And then you can watch the seeds grow and all the wildlife they are helping. And also it's great for kids to get their hands dirty. Now, who didn't love making mud pies as a kid? Keep feeding the birds. It's going to get very busy for all wild creatures soon as the main breeding season kicks in. Look out for hedgehogs waking up. And we have one in our garden that sleeps under the shed. It's been out and about already. We had a real warm spell a few weeks ago, far too early to be fair, um, but I haven't seen it since. So I'll, Now, usually my dog will find it. Um, I can hear her barking when she goes out in the evening and I know the hedgehog's out there somewhere and she'll be sniffing around frantically trying to find where the hedgehog is. She'll find the hedgehog and she'll just stand and bark at it. And of course, hedgehog has rolled itself into a ball and it isn't going to move and I have to go out there because there's a particular sound that my dog makes and I know it's the hedgehog. And she's a husky and um, she will just stand and bark. Well, howl really at the hedgehog. So I have to go out, get the dog in and the hedgehog will go about his or her business for the rest of the night. Baking. Bake some hot cross buns. Now you know the real story. Earth. I speak about this a lot and it's because I think it's one of the best things we can do. Kick off your shoes, put your bare feet on the grass or even in the mud. Yes, even in the mud. And spend at least 30 minutes just connected to the earth. Now, I can highly recommend earthing and sinking your body to the natural rhythms of the earth. And you'll thank me for this one day. You might be banging on about it now. But at some point you're going to go, hey, you know, she was right. I've had some benefits from this. Take a walk in nature. And again, this is something I recommend all the time too. Now, whether you love open fields, country lanes, woodlands, walks by the sea, out in your local park, just walk and notice the change in the season. Whether that's spring flowers blooming, the additional noise of birds, migratory birds are coming back and the landscape changing as the moorlands begin to bloom. Perhaps farmers are out in their fields. You might see lambs appearing all the sights and sounds of the parks in towns and cities are changing. Every place resonates with an energy. And rather than rush by taking, to just take that time to notice the small things along the path, in the edges, perhaps there are plants growing. Is that chickweed growing along the edge of that wall? Do you know what it is? You might have never seen it before, but all of a sudden you've changed your perspective and you've looked and seen something that you hadn't seen. Maybe you can look out for frogs and frog spawn. Look out for those hares and rabbits. And most definitely out on the roads, look out for the pheasants. If you like to write, then try some poetry or prose. With all this extra energy, you might find that your creativity is flowing as you open up to all the new things. Uh, if you like to use divination tools, try them outside and see if whilst you are grounded, something different comes to your energy field. Now, if you work with a goddess, ask her for guidance for the forthcoming weeks as we walk towards Beltana. And keep your journal by your side to write down anything that comes to mind. If you're looking for a goddess energy to work with, then you're probably better to look at other spring goddesses such as Persephone, the Greek, Freya, Norse, Blodworth, Welsh Celtic, Flora is Roman, Renpet is Egyptian, Astarte is Greek fertility goddess and Aphrodite is obviously the goddess of love. Now Brigid may also be a goddess that you're attached to. Now we do think about her mainly at Imolk, but she is such um, a versatile goddess that she will walk the whole year with you if you are, will want to work with her energy. She's probably one of our main goddesses of the British Isles, although, you know, she is associated more so with Ireland. She is very much, um, her energy is very much part of the British Isles itself. So if you work with Brigid, um, wherever you are in the world, you will find that she will walk the path with you all year round. So if you're just starting out on this path and you're not sure if it's for you and everything I have said can also sound a bit daunting um, and God only knows how many YouTube channels are out there telling you what you should be doing at this time of the year um, and how you must do it this way or you must do it that way or why not try this way. It, it, you know, you can watch 
so many of them that after a while you've watched them all and you've written down these fantastic ideas and then gone, oh, now what? All you need to do is just have a little bit of imagination and intention. There is no right or wrong way of following a path. So this is your experience after all and no one else's. So if everything I have said seems like a complete and utter faff and you just say, I don't want any of that. I just want something really simple on the day of the equinox. What can I do? Then the best thing I can suggest for a few days before and a few days after is take a walk in nature and light a candle job done. It is that simple. The worst thing we can do is get stressed over this whole thing, believing that we need to do something big, we need to be aligned to a planet or the date, and that somebody's doing it on this day and somebody's doing it on another day, and I don't know whether I should be doing it or do I want to do this? I'm, there's no goddess or star, and I'm really now totally confused. <laughs> don't. All you need to do is just embrace the spirit of spring. Embrace the spirit of fertility and the renewal of life as it begins to blossom. And really, you can't go wrong. Now, I'm sure there are a few of you listening in who already walk this path. And if you would like to share your experiences of what you like to do for the equinox, then please feel free to leave a comment. I love to hear how the inspiration flows across the world and how different people celebrate. Thank you for listening into my podcast today. It's lovely having you here. Thanks to my two Patreons again, ladies. Um, it's lovely having you supporting the channel. Now, links to all the socials and to Patreon are in the show notes. Come and join me if you'd like to. But whatever happens, whatever you do, enjoy the Vernal Equinox. And I'll be back again very soon for another podcast on walking this beautiful path connected to all the energies of Earth. Thank you for being with me and I'll see you again very soon. Much love and light and bye for now.